In Washington, D.C. today, there stands a statue of one of the most famous generals in American history, General Grant. General Grant is the general that during the Civil War, after many, many generals of the Union Army failed to defeat Robert E. Lee, General Grant was finally brought in to finish the job, and he was the one who had victory for the North in the Civil War. And today, when we look back on General Grant, he is considered a force of human will. He is an image of the strong man who stood up against evil and was able to kind of fight through the waging storm that was coming on him. And if you go to Washington, Washington D.C. today, there's this incredible, enormous statue that you can't miss where he's sitting on top of his stallion getting ready to go into battle. General Grant is a man's man in the classic picture of that language. What most people don't know is that about two and a half miles away from that statue stands a lesser known statue. It's a statue of a man named John Rollins. John Rollins, Major General John Rollins, was the chief of staff for General Grant during the Civil War. He was a man out of Galena, Illinois, and John Rollins knew General Grant very well. They became almost best of friends during the Civil War. And one of the things that Rollins knew about Grant is that Grant had a drinking problem that if Grant was not careful, would threaten to completely destroy not only his life, but the war itself. Rollins was the kind of man that was in the trenches with Grant. And whenever Rollins would see General Grant begin to slip, begin to fade, begin to go back into drinking, that great vice that has taken so many good men down, Rollins would shake him up, and he'd get in his face, he'd say, no, Grant, get out of this, you have work to do. And he stood by him, and he lifted him up, and he made sure that Grant did not succumb to the pressures of his own vices. Many people don't know about Rollins today. Many people pass by that little statue of his that's in a park two and a half miles away from the statue of General Grant. But we would not be remembering General Grant without the work of John Rollins in his life. Now, we love that we live in a world that celebrates the Lone Ranger. And even as I used that language before, the man's man, oftentimes when we think of that kind of language, what we think of is the Lone Ranger. The guy who just knows how to get stuff done and be powerful and be his own force of strength. No matter what you put before him, he's gonna bulldoze through it. No matter what trial there is, this is a man's man. Look at how much money he has. Look at how much muscle he has. This is what the world thinks about being a man is oftentimes. It has nothing to do with what the Bible has to say. We celebrate the Lone Ranger in our modern culture. Men, you need other men in your fort. You need men who you can lean on. Biblically, you are not called to be a Lone Ranger. Biblically, the worldview that the Bible gives us is that we are weak on our own and that we are wretched sinners prone to falling back into old habits of sin. And if we don't have strong men beside us, friendships that go far deeper than surface level, we are in a whole lot of trouble. And we need a few mighty men in our corner to go through this life together with. Men who you can confess your sin to and know that they're not going to run away. Men who you can be authentic and vulnerable with and know that they're the kind of guys that are going to strengthen you, they are going to stand by you, that aren't going to gossip about you, that aren't going to leave you when the going gets tough. Honestly, this depth of relationship is almost a lost form among men today. A guy named Alan Loy McGinnis, the author of a book called The Friendship Factor, says that America's leading psychologists and therapists estimate that only 10% of all men ever have any real friendships. And that's by secular standards, not even by the biblical standards of what a friendship is. Compared to our female counterparts who are far more relationally wired than us, we are not very good at this. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 to 10 says, Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Many men are good at developing surface level relationships. 
We know how to throw a ball around in the backyard with a guy. We love to do things together. And frankly, most of our relationships are built on doing stuff, right? Go, going and having an adventure together or, or throwing a ball around in the backyard or playing sports together. And I appreciate that. As a man myself, I, I love being able to do those things with other men. And they do develop a bond. They do develop a friendship. And I would not throw all of that out by any means. And yet... There is a depth of relationship that must go beyond the tasks we do together if we're going to have a few mighty men in our corner. The biblical world you demands that we pour ourselves out in love and sacrifice to others. If we're going to build our lives as men from the Bible up, we have to pursue this level of deep friendship and relationship. And can I just say, everything we've talked about thus far in this series, and everything we're gonna talk about from here on out in this series, is really dependent on your ability to surround yourself and your ability to be this to other people, a deep, meaningful friend. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It's saying if you just surround yourself by people who surface level know you and you don't have a friend who knows you as close as a brother, you are in a whole lot of trouble. Now, where can we go in the Bible to learn about friendship, particularly as men? Well, there's one friendship in the Bible that surpasses them all. Uh, this is the friendship of David and Jonathan. This friendship is so profound that, frankly, as I go through some of the passages, it might make many of you feel like it, it feels like a weird relationship in some way. Like, how could that level of friendship even be possible? But what I want to do today is I want you to look at this friendship and how it was formed and how it survived through all the difficulties that David and Jonathan went through. And I want to pull out some distinctives of what we need to be pursuing if we're going to be men of God who are sustained in our journey of becoming mature men of God. Let's start the story with Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14. We begin to get a sense for the man Jonathan in this chapter. Now, in this bit of Israel's journey, this is the Old Testament, Israel's in a bit of a dark place. The enemy army is around them. The Philistine army, who we know well from the pages of Scripture, they're a formidable foe to the Israelites all through the Old Testament. And they are surrounding the Israelites. And the Israelites are scared. They don't know what to do. And while everyone's afraid, one man stands up. And listen to Jonathan, what he says in this moment. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, reads this way. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, referring to the Philistines. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. So Jonathan goes, just him and his armor bearer, goes right into the Philistine camp. He says, I'm a man of God. I am not going to cower in fear at the enemies of the, the people of God. I'm going to go straight in here, and I'm going to trust the Lord of God to deliver us. So Jonathan goes to battle. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, read this way. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, killed them after him. And that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men within, as it were half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp in the field and among all the people, the garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked and it became a very great panic among the Philistine army. Jonathan was the man. I mean, Jonathan, devoted to God, looking at the fact that the people of God are scared out of their minds, says, why are we scared? Aren't we the people of God? Aren't we the ones who have the power of the living God at our hands? And he goes by himself with his armor bearer into the enemy camp. Now, Jonathan was a mighty warrior who trusted God. What happens next in the story of the people of God is that Jonathan begins to get a little fame because of what he's done. But his father, King Saul, is not a good king. His father, King Saul, is a very sinful man. And he slowly sank Israel into more sin and into more depravity until they were destitute. And the Philistines came right back. And once again, the people of God were lined up and they were facing an enemy. And once again, the people of God are terrified of what's going to take place. Even Jonathan, as best as we know, Jonathan, with all of his heroics, was not able to stand up when the Philistines came back. 
You know the scene, 1 Samuel chapter 17. The people of God are lined up against the Philistines, and there's a massive giant named Goliath who's coming out in front of the Philistine army. He's looking at the people of God, and he begins to taunt them. And he begins to say that your God is no God. Come, send one man out here to fight me. But it's a giant, and everyone, including Jonathan, is afraid to fight him. And then a young shepherd boy walks into the camp. A young shepherd boy named David. And David looks at what's happening. He sees the Philistines and the giant Goliath and his taunts. And he sees the people of God terrified. And in 1 Samuel 17, verse 44 to 47, we read this. Then... The Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. You hear his confidence in God? I will cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth might know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and not with spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you, Goliath, into our hand. (laughs) David proceeds to go out and with a sling and a stone slay Goliath in front of both enemies. He cuts off his head with Goliath's own sword and he holds it up for both armies to see and he says, I told you God was on our side. Now you can just imagine in that moment, Jonathan looking down at David holding up the head of Goliath and goes, going, now there's a man that I like. That's a man after my own spirit. Me and him, we got a lot in common because just a few chapters earlier, Jonathan had done something very similar. Now, I want to go through what happens next. David and Jonathan begin to form this friendship. And the first thing we see is that they had lives that were in alignment. They had lives in alignment. The first thing we see about David and Jonathan is that they wanted the same thing. Both David and Jonathan Jonathan desired to see God honored and glorified. That was the, the pinnacle of their life. The reason for their existence is that they were men of God who said, we do not want any of the enemies of the people of God to triumph. So long as we're alive and as we have breath, we are going to fight and live to see the God of Scripture glorified and honored and lifted up and his enemies taken down. And Jonathan looked into David and he said, I see a part of my heart, you've got it too. And they formed a friendship. These two seemingly very different men, Jonathan was a prince, the son of King King Saul. David was a shepherd boy. And yet even though they had so much not in common, they had this in common. They loved the Lord and they weren't gonna put up with people tearing down the name of God. Notice that their alignment was primarily around their worship of God. Both of them were men of God. When both of them spoke, they pointed back to God. They said, God is the one that will deliver us. He is the one that is capable. And both of these men had aligned their life to say, I am living for God. They wanted lives that were unmistakably, passionately lived out for God. They weren't afraid to be the one guy going in this direction when everyone else seemed to be going in that direction. And because of that, they found a unity with each other. Man, I cannot stress this enough. You need men around you who know and love Jesus Christ and who are on that path with you. And you need to be in alignment with it. There's got to be a mutual passion to see each other grow both individually and together as men of the word and as men passionately following after Christ. Is it wrong to have good friends who aren't Christians as a Christian man? No. I've got plenty of wonderful friends who are non-Christians. I love them dearly. I spend much time with them. But there's something that my Christian brothers can offer me and that I can offer my Christian brothers that we share uniquely as men of God. We're pointing each other towards Christ and we've aligned our lives in the same direction. We ought to be trying to surround ourselves with deeply passionate men of Christ who we can run this race together with. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes this in a great little book he wrote called Life Together. He says, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's words to him. He needs him again and again when he becomes uncertain and discouraged. 
He needs his brother man as a barter and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. And that also clarifies the goal of all Christian community. They meet one another as bringers of the message of salvation. Now, men, if you don't have this type of friend right now, can I challenge you? You don't need to look any further than the walls of your own local church. In fact, men, I want to challenge you. I believe that every man needs to find this level of deep relationship within their local church. Those are your men because what happens is when all the other people of the church look in and they see the men stirring one another up to love and good works, provoking one another to greater worship, drawing each other to repentance of sin and overcoming sin and growing in their maturity of Christ, when they come in and they see the men powerfully pouring each other into each other's lives like this, something happens to the rest of the church. It, a flame gets lit into the church and the whole thing rises up because the men are shaping each other. It is so powerful for the entire body of Christ. Men, you got to find friends who are in alignment with you in terms of your pursuit of Christ. Number two, you need men who are friends who consider the other as greater than themselves who consider the other as greater than themselves. The thing about David and Jonathan is that even through the whole length of their friendship, neither David nor Jonathan, no matter what position they had, thought of themselves as greater than the other. Remember, early on, Jonathan was a prince. He was royalty. Who was David? He was just the guy who slew Goliath. That makes him important, but he still was not a prince. He wasn't royalty at the time. Listen to what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 3 to 5. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. You got any friends you can say that about? Because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and he gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, this is a almost bizarre moment where the prince, Jonathan, takes off his robe and his armor and his sword and he, he places it on David. And it's a symbolic gesture in front of everybody where Jonathan looks to David and he says, you're a greater man than me. Now, Jonathan didn't have to do that. He was the prince. He was royalty. How many princes would do that? How many men in a greater position would look to someone in a lesser position and say, I honor you? But Jonathan looked to David and said, my friendship with you is such that I'm not concerned with my own greatness. I want you to succeed. For the people of God, this is the deepest form of relationship that can be made. Jonathan made a covenant with David is what we're told in verse 3. We talk about marriages between a man and a woman as a covenant, as the deepest form of relationship. But here, there's this covenant of friendship that's being made. This commitment to one another, where God's at the center of it, where we're striving and lifting up each other, that's considered a covenant. It's this deep intertwining of two men's souls, saying we are in this for each other. Jonathan is invested in David's life, and he's more concerned almost for David's life than he is for his own. Now, can you imagine a friend like that? Imagine going through this life with a couple guys in your corner that think that way about you. Now, at the same time, imagine being that man to someone else. See, if you want that in your corner, you're going to have to be that to somebody else. This type of friend is only formed with incredible intentionality. To find men that are as concerned for your well-being, with your family's well-being, with your career, with your heartache, to find men that are as concerned for all of that for you as they are for themselves is rare and almost impossible, if not for the power of God in the center of Christian community. But let me tell you, you can find it and you can be that person in other men's lives. Men have to have some men around them who care this much about them. Remember the New Testament. Jesus lays this out for us in the New Testament. Paul writes in Philippians chapter two, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as greater than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I want to argue that David and Jonathan, what they had, to be honest, was only a shadow of what you can have today. They lived in the Old Testament. 
That was before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that unites men in a new powerful way by the blood of Jesus Christ. That was all in the Old Testament, but now you have even more at your disposal. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. He's united us. He's called us to be one as he is one with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's given us a unity empowered by the Spirit that drives men together in fellowship and lifting each other up. It's only possible to count others more significant than yourself in this way in its fullness because of what Christ offers you. What David and Jonathan had is a shadow of the fullness of what you can have if you choose to live into it. And if you choose to be that in other people's life. Men, if you want to become a man like Christ, you are going to have to learn how to give your life over to see other men around you flourish even more than yourself. Number three, there was a behind the scenes love. There was a behind the scenes love. Now, what do I mean by that? Mature friendship requires a profound strength of friendship that takes place even when no one is looking, even when each other aren't looking. Now, as, here's what happened in the story of David and Jonathan. As David's popularity began to grow in Israel, it became essentially a threat to King Saul. Saul should have been the most famous person in the land. He was King Saul. And yet all of a sudden, everyone is celebrating King David's victories in the streets. They're saying that King David has killed more men than King Saul. And King Saul, because he was a weak man with a lot of insecurities, because he didn't know his identity was first rooted in God, became incredibly insecure. And he was very jealous of David. He didn't like the fact that people were singing David's praises more than they were singing Saul's praises. And so King Saul began to hate David, in fact, began to persecute David, and even tried to kill him a number of times. But listen to what Jonathan does for David when Jonathan is sitting at dinner with his father, King Saul, and David is not present. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 4 to 6. We read this. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. Now, King Saul was raging at the time in anger towards David. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, and to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, as long as the, as, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. See, Jonathan was David's greatest ally and advocate, even when David wasn't in the room. When Saul spoke ill of David, Jonathan was quick there to correct it and to say, no, 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 don't, don't speak that way about that man. I know that man. He's a great man of God. That man, he's a man that you want around you. He's the kind of man that's going to lift others up. He's the kind of man that we're going to get much further as a people of God because he's here and he's a part of it. And he wouldn't let people whisper and gossip about David so long as he was in the room. Men, what I'm describing is a deep trust in each other. A trust that is confident that your friends have your back when you're not there. That they're not going to gossip and slander about you. That even though they know your weaknesses, that even though they know your mistakes, and even though they know that they could get ahead because they have information about you that other people don't have, they're not going to share it. They're going to be in confidence. And not only are they not going to share it, but they're going to lift you up behind the scenes. They're going to make you look great when you're not there. Proverbs 16, 28, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. The quickest way to ensure that you will never have this level of friendship with another man is if you become a gossip. If you're the kind of man that cannot keep trust, if you're the kind of, can't, kind of man that doesn't truly believe that your role is to be the servant to other men and to lift them up and to see them flourish, but, but rather you're still self-centered and, and egocentric and trying to get ahead yourself and you see people as objects rather than people to pour yourself in, out in love and service to because Jesus, the one true man, poured himself out in love and service towards you. If you're still in an earthly way of thinking, you'll never have this kind of friendship. You'll never experience it and you will miss out because God's made you for it. You need a behind the scenes kind of love when it comes to the deep friendships of men in your life. Number four, strength and support in times of crisis. 
strength and support in times of crisis. Later in 1 Samuel, David's on the run from Saul. Now, you just heard what Jonathan had done. Jonathan had convinced Saul to stop trying to kill David, but Saul was a dangerous man, and he quickly changed his mind. And for several years, David goes on the run. Saul is literally hunting him to kill him. He's sending out his military to chase him down, and David is on the run with just a few ragtag group of men with not much to call themselves an army at all. They're running away from Saul. And you've got to imagine that Jonathan is probably one of Saul's leading commanders at the times. David's men are hungry, they're tired, they're exhausted, they've been running for a couple of years probably at this point. Their hope is still in God, but they're growing weary. And then 1 Samuel 23, verses 16 to 18, we read this. As Saul is persecuting and chasing David, verse 16, And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. Hear that language. Jonathan rose, found David, and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king, David, over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant. There's that language again. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. We're told that Jonathan came to David and strengthened his hand in God. Now, what did that look like? Well, we're not given details, but as a man of God who has had other men do this for me in times of crisis, I can tell you what it probably looked like. It was a time of listening. It was a time of meeting and, and, and allowing hearts to be poured out and a time of celebration that friends were coming together again. It was a time of mourning over sin and it was a time of worship to God. I bet you knowing David and the Psalms he wrote, they were singing worship together at some point in that meeting. He was strengthening his hand in God. He was reminding him of the promises of God. And he was looking at David in a weary state and saying, David, don't give up. I see you, brother. I see all the things God has planned in your life. And I'm going to help you get there. And I'm not leaving you. I'm going to be with you. Remember, that's what Jesus does for us. Jesus says, Jesus, the one true man says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I'm giving you my Holy Spirit to lift you up when you feel weak because I'm not leaving you in your, in your weariness. And that's what good friends do for each other. Da Jonathan came to David in David's brokenness. Jonathan didn't just stand aside. Now, now keep this in mind. Jonathan was a busy man. He had everything. He was royalty. He was a military guy. He had men under his command. He probably was a family man at that point. We know he has kids. We'll get to that point in just a little bit. His father's King Saul. He was, he was risking losing everything. I'm guessing Jonathan would have been put to death by his own father if his father found out that he was betraying him by going off and sneaking to David. Jonathan puts everything he has to do on hold in order to go find David, his friend, in his brokenness and to strengthen him and to lift him up. Men, godly friends, show up at great sacrifice to themselves of what they could be doing if they weren't with you. Good friends intentionally show up. You will always be busy. There will always be a long list of emails that you have to get to. There will always be dishes in the sink that you have to clean. There will always be a long list of things that you could be doing and probably should be doing. But the man of God who's committed to godly relationships where you're in covenant with each other and you say, I'm lifting you up, prioritizes those men in their life and says, I'm in it with you. And those things, though they're important, they're getting put on the side for a moment because you're in trouble and I'm showing up. When good friends call at two in the morning in a broken place and say, I need a man to talk to, the other man gets out of bed, drives to the friend house and says, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. I've seen this take place in the church and it's beautiful. And men, if we want to form these types of friendships, there has to be an intentionality. Once again, we come back, we're modeling this out of our love of Christ. This is the church. Christ died for the church, for his bride, and he's filled us with his spirit to be in relationship and to have a unity among ourselves that matches the type of unity that God has with himself in the Trinity, that you may be one as we are one, says Jesus in, Acts, in the high priestly prayer. We can have this if we commit to each other. It's difficult to have this kind of friendship with every man you know. It's almost impossible you can't. But you can choose a few men to surround yourself 
with who know you and who you know them, and you are going to show up on a dime when it's needed, the way Jonathan showed up for David. Finally, a commitment to the future. A commitment to the future. A few chapters later, David is once again being hunted by Saul. Jonathan was able to hold Saul off with his wise words for just a little bit, but soon enough, just as we saw, David is being hunted by Saul. And Jonathan and David have this conversation before they part ways from each other for a little bit. We read this in 1 Samuel chapter 20. David's just about to go on the run, and Jonathan and David have a conversation with each other. John, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 13 to 17. We read this. Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed towards David, shall I not send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away that you might go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, Show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And then verse 17, we read similar language. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Jonathan looks to David, not knowing what the future is going to hold. And he says, look, I'm, we're in this together. And whatever happens to me, David, will you swear to my family? Will, will, you, will you swear you'll take care of my family? That you'll look upon my house and you'll be good to my family, even if I die in the process? See, what he's saying is our friendship exceeds just you and me. We're taking an interest in the larger household that we're a part of and in all of our affairs. See, godly men are care, care about the entire family of God, other godly men. When something happens in the family member of a, a good friend's life, we take interest of it. At the very end of 1 Samuel, Jonathan dies in battle. And David writes this powerful poem about the death of both Saul and Jonathan. It's a lament. And we read it in 2 Samuel, verse, uh, 2 Samuel 1, verses 25 to 26. David laments over the death of Jonathan. He says, How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain on the high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love for me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. You can feel the pain. And I love that last line. Your, your love to me has surpassed even the love of women. They develop this brotherhood, this friendship, that when David reflects on the death of this friendship, he realizes that this was perhaps one of the most profound relationships in his entire life, surpassing even the love of women. Later, when David comes into his kingdom in 2 Samuel, one of the first things David does is he looks to make good on his promise to Jonathan that he would take care of Jonathan's household. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, And David said as he's stepping into his household, Is there still anyone left from the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And sure enough, David finds a boy, one of the family members of Jonathan, who needed help. And David makes him basically almost treated like a prince. That young man gets to sit at David's household and eat from his table because of the promises and the steadfast love that David had towards Jonathan and all of Jonathan's family. David makes good on his promise. Men, the level of friendship I'm talking about now cannot be temporary. We need to be in each other's lives for the long haul. We need to see each other through the generations and through the decades of our life and be with us through all the mountain peaks and the valleys that we're going to come through because life is long. There's many years to live. It's a marathon and there's great seasons and there's tough seasons and you need a few good men, a few brothers in arms to go through them with. That's what David had in Jonathan. I got a few of those men in my life. These are men that I get together with regularly, and we pour our heart out to each other. We talk about the difficulties that we're going through. We all know each other's families, and we know each other's friends. We know each other's kids, and, and we, we're celebrating the things that are happening in our kids' lives with each other, and we're watching our, our friends' kids grow up, and we're for each other, and we're committed to one another. And it takes work. It takes diligence to pursue that kind of friendship. But can I tell you, 
You can have it if you chase after it. I want to close this with a very important word. I hope you don't take this lightly. Men, like I said, we're very good at surface level friendships. We know how to throw a ball with each other. We know how to have a fun time together. But I want to challenge you. You've got to make that awkward first step of going past just doing stuff together and of getting to know each other relationally, getting to know our hearts, getting to know our sense of worship in Christ, getting to know our weaknesses and where we're vulnerable and our insecurities, and then investing in each other in such a way that we become better men of God, better worshipers, better husbands to our wives and fathers to our children, and and better leaders in our church and community. Why? Because there's other men committed to seeing us flourish. Can I challenge you, if you're doing this in a group of men, you might not need to look beyond the men you're doing this with right now. You might just need to look around the room that you're in and and, and see other men and probably know that if, if you don't have what I'm talking about, they might not have it either. And what might need to happen is for you to take an intentional step to beginning to form this kind of friendship. Your spiritual maturity and your journey depends on it. I'm grateful for you joining me this week and I look forward to seeing you next week.